Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel and thank you for joining me today for an exploration into technology of the old world, beyond records. We've already spent the week exploring remarkable buildings, amazing cities, and even looking into the potential history of an actual old world people. Today we're going to look at the technologies that came from the old world and the civilization that preceded ours. Our goal is to gain a greater understanding and achieve an overview of what sort of technologies were available and what technologies actually made their way to our contemporary world. We have reason to believe that there are many, if not all, of our modern technologies that are drawn from what was originally available in the old world. And today we're going to explore some of them and where they came from. One of the most amazing technologies that we see, and we're aware of that our official historical narrative tells us came from the 19th century is electricity. Most specifically, the dynamo. And here you see this amazing dynamo, supposedly the largest one ever constructed. But is there more to the dynamo? What do we have on record about it? What does the patent say about the dynamo? And why are patents important? Let's take a look at the original patent that we had for the dynamo. What year was it filed and what does it say? Let's examine the official patent from the United States Patent Office concerning the dynamo. This particular patent was patented on August 28, 1883, and in three sheets they lay out what the dynamo is all about. Number 284,110. And yet, when we look at the figures, we see a very rough sketch, and you have to wonder, do these figures really give you an idea of what the dynamo can actually do? What amazes me is just how generic these sketches are, these drawings or these renderings. Do these really seem like they're plans to build the amazing machine that we just looked at? Or does this just look like some sort of rough sketch that somebody did? Now, of course, people can defend this by saying, yes, this is the US Patent Office. You only need to give a very general idea of what this device is. Yet you have to wonder, is that really the intent behind it? I thought the whole intention behind the patent office was to make sure that the appropriate people received credit for their quote unquote invention. And here you have it here, inventors Carl Zipper Nasqui and Maximilian Duru, I believe. Difficult to read that cursive there. I mean, I can write cursive, although it's not something I'm practiced on reading anymore, which I don't think many of us are. And down here we notice this little note, N. Peters, photolithographer, Washington, D.C. So you have to wonder, what's the story behind this so-called patent, and why is it so generic? These are really about the only drawings that you'll see of this very complicated dynamo machine. Well, let's see if there's anything that's stated about the operation of the dynamo in the text of the patent. Let's return to examining this amazing technology after our very elucidating look at the original patent. Now, yes, I was being a little comical. I understand that the patent information may be incomplete, that the government simply wanted a concept overview, that records could be lost, that I didn't find all the records detailing the extensive range of concept and detail and instructions on how to assemble a dynamo. Maybe they just didn't want it, or maybe they don't have it. Regardless, this is a remarkable piece of technology, and when you see something on this scale that's been with us since the 1880s, so our official history tells us, it's remarkable to consider. The other aspect about these dynamos and the size and the scale is just how were these machined and constructed? Remember the limitations that we supposedly had in the 19th century, and yet we could assemble something like this? Now, we're told that the Industrial Revolution came about in the 18th century and that its effects were really felt in the 19th century and that steam power drove everything. Yes, so we say. But yet, we didn't even have heavy machinery widely available until the early 20th century, and even that's a bit of a stretch. Just building something like this, just in terms of the hardware, to say nothing of the actual technology that makes it work, is a remarkable achievement if it happened as they told us. And yet dynamos were exhibited, of course, in the World's Fairs. And here we have the World's Fair of France. Not exactly sure which one because the timeline was not exactly clear on it. And I can't verify if this was actually a World's Fair in France. But nevertheless, this image is remarkable because it shows a series of dynamos at that same size. So not just one, but one, two, three, four, 
just incredible with this amount of scale and work that went into assembling these. And just for display, and we're told that these are the original power generators, that this is what provided power to light these amazing displays and this remarkable event. It's intriguing when you think about what goes into the dynamo. Oh, and here's another one right there, arranged a different way. It's intriguing when you think about the components that go into it, the actual construction of these devices, to say nothing of what the knowledge behind arranging them to operate them to generate power required. It's a remarkable series of questions, and it's something that stays with us. And here we have other images. Now, we're told that these could be steam-powered wheels, or that these are different types of generators. Yet, this all existed. This was all completed at the end of the 19th century. Where I see the difficulty in understanding how this happened, as we were told, is in the scale and the construction and the materials. We could believe easily that perhaps if the entire society or an entire state gathered its resources and focused, perhaps they could build one of these, maybe even two of these. But several in a single location to this extent? It's a remarkable consideration that brings about something that our civilization in the 19th century had far more capability than we give it credit for, if we believe the historical narrative. Now, this is more of a steam-powered turbine, we're told. But again, could this have some other function, or could this be something that we don't even fully understand? Because really, we just have a picture of it, and you're not going to get information from the patent office. And perhaps records are intentionally incomplete, or maybe the person who was supposed to keep the records lost their shoebox, if we remember our shoebox record-storing judge from southwest Iowa in an earlier video. I enjoy the fine detailing that comes about with the gears and the scale. And you look at how wide and the diameter on this and what it would really require to put this together. I'd also like to know how they moved these materials. Well, they just pulled out some horses and they hauled it around and it was relatively easy. Now moving on with the concept of steam power, we have to wonder about the steam engine locomotive and the origin on that. Now, I'm not going to go into extreme detail in this video. I'm just going to introduce the concept to everybody. We don't really think about how steam locomotives suddenly became available. But even more to the point is when you try to look up concept designs, patents, you don't really get extreme detail, or at least it's not very easy to find. You get a lot of profile drawings like this, and they'll tell you, yes, this is a schematic of a steam engine. This is how you build one. Okay, just give me a profile shot. I don't need to know dimensions. I don't need to know materials. Nope, nope, here's your picture, and you just go out and you can build it. It goes back to that original question of the size of these steam engines and what kind of effort and resources it would have taken to construct them. Also, the number of steam engines that were shown. Even during the United States Civil War, we're told that the Confederate States of America a nation, well, really an upstart nation that was never officially recognized, had the capability to utilize steam engines and even utilize them in a manner to decisively affect battles to include the first major battle of the Civil War, Bull Run. We're told that the Confederate States Army were able to rapidly move soldiers to reinforce their position at Bull Run or Manassas, as they called it. It's one of those details that we tend to miss because we just take it for granted. Well, we always had steam engines. They were always with us. It doesn't really matter how they came about. They were useful and the railroads were always there. So be it. Yet we have a lot of evidence on how the people that use steam engines seem to treat them. And <laughs> to say that they were regarded as disposable is probably being derogatory to the word disposable. It's as though there was no consideration for steam engines. You could even say the old analogy that they were tossed away like toilet paper. Although recent events have shown us that toilet paper could be quite valuable, or anything's valuable if you say it is, so I guess it all matters with what your perception is. Yet you'll find many pictures and many examples of how steam engines were considered utterly and totally disposable. Crashed into things, and look, you know, let's have a little picnic here. Look at this amazing crash. 
let's bring the wife and the kids and go take a look at it. And we got our hats on and we'll enjoy it. And I'm just going to put my arm up and relax. Hey, did you see a steam engine crash last weekend? Oh yeah. A locomotive came into my house. So are they going to pay out the insurance? No, we don't have insurance. Well, at least you don't pay taxes, right? No, I pay property taxes. Oh, right. So remarkable series of considerations. And then of course you'll find lots of video footage of an exhibition and yes i'll say it's an exhibition they call it a spectacle <laughs> what a euphemism of crashing steam engines together and you can find lots of video footage of it so a disposable device yet something that was supposedly difficult to construct that required a lot of materials and you know, we're just going to waste them because we don't have anything better to do consider the concept of the crane as well and this was supposedly a crane what they called the old hamster wheel crane, where you'd have a couple people that would get in it, and then they would use that kind of power to move heavy blocks. This is hilarious. This picture on the left is supposedly from the construction of the Tower of Babel. Yeah, so the hamster wheel crane did it. Good old human power. Let's hop on in there, Bob, and we're going to churn our legs, and we'll be able to pick up gigantic granite blocks. It gets really funny when you consider the end of this video. And now we're going to move on to the fascies. The fascies has been covered in great detail. And what is the fascies? Well, we're told it was a symbol of power and authority from the Roman Empire and the old days of the Roman Republic, if it really existed, which at best is extremely questionable. I find these depictions, though, of the fascies on the left and right potentially more accurate. And we have the classic drawing where we say it's the axe and the bundled series of rods. But yet you see a different depiction when you look at these actual inscriptions and these carvings. And you get the feeling that there was more of a mechanical aspect to these devices. But what function could the fascies have served? Well, there's been some theories that it's a sound weapon, that it's an energy weapon. We typically see it associated with armies and soldiers carrying it. And we have to keep everything on the table. It could have been a sound weapon. It could have been an energy weapon. Or it could have been something else completely beyond our ability to fully understand based on the capabilities and going deep into the past of technologies that could be beyond our understanding. Nope, you're not going to see in the patent office the fascies energy weapon. That would probably keep things a little too simple and wars would end too fast and we can't have that. And some other depictions of it. And here is where you get the clouded picture of what the fascies was and is. Where, oh, it always had an axe on it. But was it an axe or was it some sort of control device apparatus? And this is just the way that through drawings and sketches, we tried to cloud what the actual purpose of it was. Yet when you compare it to the carvings, you see that the carvings or the actual depictions of them, they look more advanced than the drawings of them. Remarkable consideration. And then that takes us to all the amazing organs that we see in cathedrals and churches across the entire land. The organs definitely have a sound function to them, but we also have theories on frequency and resonance and other means of manipulating or changing the landscape. You might recall earlier in the week when you looked at the star forts that we had, what methods did they use to really shape the land? It seemed as though they had some sort of advanced technology that went beyond simple classic excavation or using physical devices to remove and change the land. Consider what you could do with all these amazing sound devices if you had the ability to really manipulate forces and achieve some sort of kinetic effect just by using sound. It requires its own video and probably a series of videos because it's remarkable what these devices could have done. And yet we see devices in churches across the world and well, need to be a special exploration into churches because what use did they have? In the War of the Worlds video, we posited that these devices were in churches and that churches very likely were a refuge or an actual sanctuary for people. What were they escaping from? What was really going on? All interesting questions to be asked. And now we move to Knights in Armor. And this was inspired a little bit by the earlier exploration of the film Excalibur. But we have to ask the question, how feasible was it for... <laughs> medieval knights to be wearing three to five hundred pounds of armor and being remotely mobile. Now we're told by our historical account that most of the plate armor depicted here on the left and in the center, this was simply for ceremonial purpose and it wasn't actually used in combat. It wasn't meant to be used in combat. And of course the historical narrative walked it back a little bit by saying, well, knights really just wore chain mail from 
the 10th to the 14th century. And then they transitioned to plate armor, but it was all ceremonial. And then they tried to settle in a nice little compromise here. You've got Guy Gisburn from the series Robin of Sherwood, where he's wearing a little bit of an amalgamation, different type of segmented armor, perhaps inspired by what the Roman soldiers originally wore. You have to imagine, though, how practical would it have been for a human being to be lumbering around in 500 pounds of armor, losing your mobility, and not to mention being in the elements, being under the sun or even in the rain, it can have extreme effects. Now you can find lots of videos where someone will throw on the armor for about five to 10 minutes and then try to give you an idea of what it's like and they have merit. But consider wearing this for battles that lasted days, weeks, campaigns that lasted months and you couldn't take your armor off because then you'd be exposing yourself. And if you were on a horse, what if you got knocked off your horse? And of course you see the interesting depictions where we see cranes being used to hoist fully armored knights onto their horses. It just doesn't seem very practicable. However, it does appear a lot more practicable if you had the concept of powered armor. Now here we have King Arthur from the movie Excalibur in, in the shiny armor. But what if this was really a reference to the concept of powered armor? And here we have a depiction from the Fallout series of games where powered armor was considered a decisive piece of technology. And then one of the original depictions from the original novel Starship Troopers by Robert Heinlein in 1959, and the powered armor was a decisive advantage for the Terran mobile infantry. And then we have some other depictions of powered armor. Armor suddenly takes on an entirely different meaning and practicality when you consider the fact that it may be powered, and how could it have been powered? Well, did they have special generators? Did they have other means of power generation? In the Fallout series, it was, I'm trying to remember if it was mini reactors, and I think in Starship Troopers, again, I'm shooting from the hip here, they had the concept of a mini reactor that came with the suit. But if you think about having greater means of power generation and other aspects that could be miniaturized, because we've achieved miniaturization with computers, why couldn't we do it with power generation? And if you could do it with power generation, then what are the limits in terms of armor and having this type of suit? that is powered. What sort of difference would that make in a conflict? And then we move on to the old Tesla tower and the concept of factoring into atmospheric power and atmospheric energy. And that's certainly a topic in and of itself that'll require probably a series of videos to adequately explore. But remember the aspect of why we have so many large towers from the old world and drawing energy from the atmosphere. We know that there's a lot of energy. We can see it. We see lightning and we also know and believe potentially that there was other aspects of technology that we don't fully understand. Some even go so far as to say that Tesla had the ability to tap into wireless. Now, other people say Tesla was a fake and very likely was, but the technology that was discussed seems to be quite real. And the real discussion seemed to be what was going to be revealed to the masses at the start of the 20th century and what was going to be kept close hold or not shared. You have to wonder if that becomes the true purpose of a reset for whoever is making these decisions. And we have other diagrams and this shows a classic tower where you look at antenna and amplifier resonating modulator. We also talk about the presence of red mercury in the container of the capacitor. Some theories even talk about gold. Like we have the gold plated dome in the Iowa state capital and they say that the gold itself would be cheaper than painting it gold, which is hilarious. And yet this gives you an idea and actually this sketch here is better than the sketches we had earlier of the dynamo and the patent. Well, I'm sure that's a coincidence. You can also find numerous images and illusions of what supposedly is the drawing of power into large towers, but maybe it's representing something else as well. Perhaps it's another kind of energy that we can't fully understand. And we go back and talk about uh, the aviation aspect of it, that rockets were supposedly with us back in the 17th century with a Turkish officer trying to launch himself into the sky. Interesting experiment. And the fact that the jet turbine engine, the first patent for that was in the very early 20th century. So again, it gives reference that maybe this technology with, was with us a lot longer and this was just merely what they decided to disclose. Because we still have to answer this question, how in the heck did we go from a glider in 41 years to what's essentially a stealth 
jet fighter. Now, it didn't have stealth capability, although then conversely we're told that, yes, the capability of stealth came in the shape of the aircraft. So which is it? You'll hear both, and aviation experts will tell you it's both. Regardless, it's a remarkable advancement in a short period of time, and how would it really be possible? Well, conflict and human ingenuity. Don't underestimate human ingenuity. Believe me, I do not underestimate human ingenuity at all, especially when it comes to the ability to deceive. This is a depiction of the Williams X-Jet and the Hiller VZ-1 Pawnee. Now, I think everyone or most everyone has seen the imagery of gentlemen just trying a levitation device, a vertical takeoff device, simply by using beetle wings on the bottom of it. Now, there's a lot of conflicting accounts of that, and some people will question the veracity of the event depicted on the left, and it does seem very fantastical. Regardless, though, we do know for a fact that the Williams X-Jet and the Heller VZ-1 Pawnee did truly exist. The Williams X-Jet was even developed as late as the 1980s, and the Hiller VZ-1 Pawnee is from the 1950s. So it's clear we had vertical takeoff capability and we had the technology to do it. And of course, we go back to the whole concept of why we're not supposed to be flying around and looking at things and why if you get your drone, it has a lot of control factors on it. And it's clear there are certain things that you're just not supposed to see. And we recall our explorations into the Viminas, and we'll be looking more into that along with uh, that entire society in that part of the world. It has its own very unique story. And looking at some of the remarkable buildings that are present in the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia. It's a very beautiful area, and there's going to be a large series of videos coming up on that. So I'm not ignoring that. I just want to make sure that I give it its due diligence because there's so many different aspects to cover. And you can be completely blown away just by looking at a single building anywhere in India. It's remarkable. And it definitely shows the amazing ability of architecture and detailed construction to achieve. All the inventions that came from the 19th century, and we have to take it all together in totality. We have the diesel engine that came from the 19th century. Supposedly the original battery came from the 19th century, although that's very questionable. I think many of us have seen that episode of In Search of with Leonard Nimoy where they had that rock that they cut in half and they showed that it was a very old battery. Of course, they'll tell us it's an out-of-place artifact and it's easily explainable, naturally. The microphone supposedly was invented before the 1850s. The original typewriter, which they developed the adding machines from, and eventually those evolved in the computer. And the roller coaster, although there's a lot of theories that say that roller coasters might have had a completely different purpose. But all these devices came from the 19th century, and there's far too many pieces of technology to list in the scope of this video, but we will be exploring it in the due course of time. Finally, we'll look at swords as well. We have contemporary accounts of swords that we can't replicate. An old Viking sword that was found that is supposedly made of a steel that we can't replicate. Damascus steel. We can duplicate it to some extent, but we don't know, or at least we're told that we don't know, what the original construction method of it was to truly forge Damascus steel. And I'm not going to share what the name of this remarkable piece of work is, but there will be a video coming up where we're going to explore it explicitly because it requires it. There is a lot of enigma with this uh, particular sword. And then, of course, the whole concept behind forging of swords is remarkable, and I think there's a lot more to it that reflects the old world technology than we're fully aware of. Finally... There's returning to the concept of how all these amazing structures and buildings were built. What sort of facilities and pre-existing construction kits existed? And a lot of people say they don't see the evidence of these large facilities or what remains of these large, large construction kits. There is a little bit of evidence that remains. And I believe that the larger evidence has either been completely destroyed or it's concealed in some ways. Yet there are still signs of it, such as this obelisk that's still on the ground in Egypt. This large stone near Baalbek, Lebanon. And you look at the grooving in it, it's quite remarkable that this was achieved and something like this was cut so precisely on the scale. And I'll ask you the question, do you think we can move this 1,000 ton stone today using our modern means? And if so, how would we do it? And in China, another large stone quarry, and this will be a subsequent exploration as well, 
but just the size and the scale. I'm sure there's going to be people out there that would try to tell you that this is just done by natural forces, you know, erosion. And there was an earthquake that just snapped it off from the surrounding rock face very precisely. Who really knows how old this is and who knows what sort of construction site this was originally part of? Remarkable considerations all around. What are you saying? Oh, Carl. Look, this isn't a video you were supposed to be in, okay? Listen. We had an agreement, and our agreement was that you would have me on at least one video a week, if not two videos. You know that I am very popular. Well, actually, I suspect that you've been turning viewers away from the channel, which is why you don't get a guest starring credit anymore. Listen, that is very rude of you. I am here to tell you that I am going to be composing bonus content to Cosmos. Look, Carl, you're not here to plug your personal advertisements, okay? Do you have something to say about this content or not? Well... I think that you should believe in what the science is telling you, and you should know that your government always works to advance the cause of science, and that all of this technology was developed, just as they said, in the 19th century. And you shouldn't question it. It really happened. Well, I have no doubt that it really happened, Carl. It's just a question of when it happened and who was really behind it. You know, human ingenuity is how we were able to determine where the galaxies were located. Do you know that it was merely a woman who was working as a human computer who determined the distance of variable stars. And it was by determining the distance of variable stars that we were able to ascertain that there were galaxies and not nebula out there. Did you know that? Well, yes, Carl, I was aware of that. And I wanted to ask you a question. How exactly were you able to pinpoint the exact location of these so-called variable stars when you yourself said that the universe is finite but unbounded? In other words, it's four dimension, meaning that the position of those stars, while we see them in one point in the sky, they could be in a different point. What if they're exactly behind us? How would your variable calculations on distance have any meaning? How would parallax matter for that account? Uh, I, I, I think I'm, I'm having... I'm having I'm, I'm, it's difficult deep deep space communication okay well I think we're losing Carl because of uh, communications difficulties so anyways it's a remarkable consideration when we look at the technological components of our current society but we have to wonder what sort of technology did they really have available in the past we have every indication that it vastly exceeds anything that we can dream of and we'll continue to explore it. Well, thank you for joining me. As always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe.